see them. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk in your favorite queer talks, and it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, so, as Castle mentioned, I'm going to talk about mixed knowledge <coughs> for a pain free platform, and uh, here is an outline of the talk. Um, first, as a way of introducing the X-ray transform and the radon transform, I will mention very basic things about image reconstructions using projections. And then I will introduce the K-play transform. I will we follow with which normally what it is for the K-play transform. We talk about motivation, no results, and our own results. And the K-play transform is an operator that is a particular case of the more general class of operators, potential like operators associated with big planes. So I will also talk a little bit about mixed normal inequalities for those more general operators. And finally, I will introduce the hard little maximum operator associated with big planes, which constitute a main tool in our approach. So let's start with the following. Suppose that you have an object and you only know its surface and you want to determine the nature of this object without cutting it open. And determining the nature of the object means finding the density at each point of the object. Okay. So consider uh, an object like the one in that figure with a uniform background, and suppose that that is a section of a three-dimensional body, of a three-dimensional part of the human body, and the background constitutes a soft uniform tissue and the object is a tumor also uniform but with higher absorption characteristics. And you know that the X-rays have the property of determining the total mass of an object in their line of travel. Okay? So we can pass a beam of X-rays from left to right there and on the right we have this a detector strip that will detect the total mass along the line of travel. So I get a 1D data that is uh, detected by that strip. With that, sh just one projection, I don't have too much information about my the body that I have. I could have just one or several, I don't know. But I can use that data to start the reconstruction. And I can do that by projecting that one data back along the line from where the, the, the beam came. Well, that's a start. We change directions and we do the same now, let's say, in a direction perpendicular to the direction that I used before. And I back project again. Okay, that's the back projection. And now I look at the two back projections together and now I can tell that my object would be in that square that has twice the intensity as the intensities of the back projection separated. And now, as the number of projections increase, and I back project, I get much more information about the object that I have. So let's look at these projections mathematically. Okay, and very simple here. Let's identify a line in a plane with two parameters, rho and theta. Theta is the angle such that cosine of theta, sine of theta is perpendicular to your line. And rho is distance, sine distance to the origin. And so here is a picture of a frame. Uh, we are fixing. Oh, no. No. Okay. We are fixing theta there, and we are looking at all these different projections for different values of rho. So g of rho comma theta is the density of the object, uh, or the total density, the total mass of the object along the line of travel. That line it has parameters rho and theta. And so G is the total mass of that object along that line, which I'm calling L here. And therefore, it's the integral along the line L of a function f of xy, where f of xy is the density of the object at the point f1. So that function G, depending on these two parameters, is called the x-ray transform or radon transform of the density function F. And it was first radon in 1917 that showed that f can be determined from g. Okay? And since then, there are a lot of theorems that have been proved for determining g, no, uh, f knowing g, with different hypotheses as assumed on the density function uh, uh, f. Okay. Uh, now I want to introduce the k-plate transform. Before doing that, let me introduce 
the x-ray transform in our end, so the notation will help there. And as you see, the idea is very, very simple. You have a density function f, and you integrate that function along every line. And that each line is associated with these two parameters, rho and theta in this case. Well, you can do the same in our end, okay? The only difference in notation is that now you identify a line in our end through a vector u, a unit vector u, and a point x, and now t1f of x comma u will be the integral of the restriction of your function f along the line in the direction of u that go through the point x. So what's the k-plate transform? Very simple. Lines have one dimension. K-plate transforms are obtained in the same way by considering now subspaces of dimension k in our end. So my notation here is tkf of x comma pi is the following. Pi is a k-dimensional subspace in our end. And what you're doing here is integrating the restriction of f on the translate of pi that goes through the point pi, the uh, x. A notation lambda k is Lebesgue measure on pi, k-dimensional Lebesgue measure on pi. And of course, when k is equal to 1, you obtain the x-ray transform. And when k, when k is equal to n, uh, n minus 1, uh, this transform is uh, known as the radon transform. And note that in the case of dimension 2, the radon transform and the x-ray transform coincide. Uh, also, for the purpose of notation in the, in the future slides, I'm going to denote by gm comma k the Grassmannian manifold of k-dimensional subspaces in our end. Uh, it's just the uh, family of k-dimensional subspaces in our end, <coughs> and we are also going to consider the measure that you can define there. If there is a way of defining a finite measure, there is invariant under the orthogonal group, and we will use that measure in the next few minutes. So what follows is showing work with Javier Duan de Coetzea and Osane Oro Echevarria, both from Universidad del País Vasco in Spain. And what I'm going to do now is to motivate these mixed norm inequalities that we studied for the K-plane transform. And I will do that by starting the motivation with the X-ray transform. So here is something that, if you're not a mathematician, <laughs> don't worry too much. It's something, it's a singular intern with volume kernel. Um, and um, <coughs> we have this kernel omega of x comma y prime that satisfies certain conditions in order for that principal value to be well defined. But we are not wor worried about th those conditions. Just let's say that omega is, a, as a function of its second variable, is in a Lebesgue space, and that the norm in that Lebesgue space is bounded by a constant uniform in x. Okay? Those are just assumptions for, for what is coming. And uh, now, if you apply the method of rotations to the operator t omega, that is use polar coordinates, that operator t of t sub omega is written as one half of the integral over the unit sphere of the kernel omega times something that is called the directional Hilbert transform, okay, which is defined in that way as a principal value. U there is a unit vector. And let's say that you are interested in studying boundedness properties of T sub omega in Lebesgue spaces. So you want to see where, for which values of T, T sub omega is bounded from LP into LP. Well, if you use uh, Kölner's inequality, you will see very easily that those estimates will follow if you have this type of mixed norm estimate for the Hilbert transform. Okay? Uh, for, the, for the directional Hilbert transform. So if you are integrating in U first, and then you are integrating with respect to the space variable x. And these type of estimates are trivial for p larger than or equal to r because the Hilbert transform is an operator that is bounded in p for p greater than one. And they are not, they are not trivial for p less than r. A part of those estimates for p less than r were proved by Caldeon and Sigmund. And yes. Can you remind me what r is again? Oh, uh, r. r little r. Yes, P, Q, and R are always larger than or equal to 1. Equal to 1 depends, you 
you might have weak ice cream. Um, yeah, I'm so used to considering it larger than one that I, I never said that. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, okay, so there are partial results for P less than R. Um, the directional hyper transform shows up by considering omega being odd in the second variable. If omega is even in the second variable, the directional operator that shows up is the directional maximal operator. And again, non trivial estimates, meaning uh, P less than R, uh, have been proved for these operators. Uh, Robert Perfurman, Pauli Moncheri, Chris Onikachia, and Gopio Francia have proved several non trivial mixed norm uh, inequalities for this operator. Uh, so both uh, the HU and MU are directional operators. The X ray transform <coughs> is also a directional operator. And it shows up in a similar way as these two operators show up if we consider an integral operator with variable kernel where the homogeneity now is negative n minus 1. Okay? So again, if you apply the method of rotation, and for that formula, I am assuming that omega is odd. You don't need to <coughs> you can replace that equality by an inequality. Uh, so as you see, the operator that shows up is exactly the x-ray transform. T1F of X comma E. And so, proving um, um, boundless properties from LFX space LP into LFX space LQ for the original operator R, I, U, omega follows from mixed norms inequalities for the X ray transform. Okay? And so, this is the type of inequalities that I want to talk about today. Integration first with respect to u in the unit spheres. Integration after that with respect to x, the space variable. Um, now, uh, what would be the counterpart of this inequality in the case of k-plate transforms? Very simple. First of all, if you observe in T1f, evaluated as u or negative u gives you the same thing. So that integration will be uh, done instead of the, over the whole sphere, over half sphere. And half sphere is the Grassmannian manifold Gm, comma 1. And surface measure is the surface that one considers on the Grassmannian manifold. Okay? So in the case of the K-plane transform, use the Grassmannian manifold and integrate with respect to the measure that you have defined there in Gm, comma K. Okay, so the, that is inequality one. The other type of inequality I want to mention, that for which we also have some results, is uh, the one where you consider a, a reverse order of integration. First, integrate with respect to the space variable, and then integrate with respect to pi. You have to be careful there, because tkf of x comma pi is constant on translate of the, uh, plane, of the k plane pi. So, if you want to uh, uh, reverse the order of integrations, you have to integrate with respect to x, but x varying in the orthogonal complement of pi. Otherwise, if you want to integrate in Rn, that integral will be infinite. So from now, from now on, inequality 1 and inequality 2 will be those. Recall, when inequality 1 will be first integration with respect to pi and then with respect to x. Inequality 2 will be first iteration with respect to x and then with respect to pi. And also remember the indices, p will always refer to the argument f, r will refer to integration with respect to pi, and q will refer to integration with respect to x. And they are always greater than or equal to 1. So uh, let me first mention some necessary conditions on the indices p, q, and r so that these inequalities hold. Okay. Sorry, necessary condition on the indices. And the arguments are the standard arguments, scaling arguments and checking inequalities with certain functions. For example, for inequality one, the scaling argument gives you a relation between P and Q. <coughs> checking inequality with the characteristic function of the unit ball gives you a relation between R and P. And checking inequality with the characteristic function of certain parallel pi gives you a bound for R. You have, similarly, uh, necessary conditions on the indices for inequality 2 by doing scaling arguments and checking 
uh, with certain functions. Known results uh, for inequality one, they are have they are sharp estimates. Sharp estimate means that the necessary conditions that I stated in the previous slides are also sufficient. And these were proved in the case of the X-ray transform that is k equals one and the rate of transform that is k equals n minus one, and they were proved by Juan de Cochia and Olga Echevarria. Uh, in inequality two, the conjecture is that the indices, uh, as given in the necessary conditions, are also sufficient. They are the, the conjecture has been proved for k larger than or equal to n over two, and there are partial results for k less than n over two. And some names: uh, Solomon, Strickers, Oberlin, Stein, Drury, Chris, and Wolf. Now, uh, it turned out that this problem was very difficult in the general situation. So what we did was to study inequality one and two for the k-plane transform when restricted to the class of radial functions in Rn. Okay. So a radial function in Rn is a function that is constant on, on spheres centered at the origin. And in that, when we restricted to that class of functions, we were able to obtain necessary and sufficient conditions on the indices for those inequalities one and two to hold true. And here is the theorem. What the theorem is, um, uh, inequality one for radial fun function, functions hold true if and only if those three uh, uh, conditions on the indices hold. As you see, the condition on the middle is the one coming from the scaling, and the condition, the last condition is the one coming by checking the inequality with the characteristic function of the unit ball. G and K. Test press press manifold. As I stated, the inequalities in, right. in the rating in the Brahmanian manifold and in the rating with respect to yes, exactly. Those are the inequalities. One and two, the, the same inequalities hold for this range. So it works for the sphere too, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. 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 <coughs> when 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 K is one, you have the unit sphere. Right. Okay. And uh, inequality two holds if and only if those conditions hold. And again, the only condition that really uh, stayed from necessary conditions is the one coming from the scale. The other conditions were conditions that were checked with functions that were non-radial. Well, except for the p less strictly than n over k. And here is the theory in pictures. As you see, once you determine p, your q is totally determined by the scaling condition. So this is a picture of 1 over p against 1 over r. And the inequalities hold if and only if 1 over p, 1 over r are in the, in the green uh, regions. Um, Uh, now, a key estimate here, which I show you in the next slide, was the estimate corresponding to p equal to n over k, r equal to infinity. Okay? So it's, an est it's a key estimate that you have to prove here and here. Okay? That's the same one. And then for the rest, uh, use boundedness property of risk potentials and interpolation arguments. So let me show you this estimate on the endpoint. It looks like that. You have a radially symmetric set, and pi is a translate of a k plane in Rn. So we can prove that the k dimensional Lebesgue measure of the intersection of the set E with the translate of, uh, with, with pi is bounded by a constant that depends only on k and n, and n times the Lebesgue measure of the set E to the power k over n. Here is a picture with n equals 2 and k equals 1. E is the union of those three annuli that you see there. Uh, pi is that line. And what we are saying in this case is that the length of the intersection of pi with the three annuli is at most a constant times the area of the three annuli to the power one half. And this is a, a, an inequality that can be translated to something that we call restricted weak type. Okay? But the way that we shade it and prove it is very geometric. Okay, uh, now let's move on and pass to potential.
special type of radios associated to K-plates from which the K-plane transform are particular cases. And again, I'm going to motivate this with the case of K plus 1 that gives you the X-ray transform. So let's do the same thing as we did at the beginning using the method of rotations, but now let's consider a kernel that has homogeneity negative n minus alpha. And if you apply polar coordinates, um, again, for my computations here, omega is assumed to be uh, odd with respect to its second variable, but you don't need to do that. Okay. Uh, what shows up now is this directional operator, T sub alpha. Okay. So as you see, when alpha is equal to 1, that is the X-ray transform. And again, if you want to study bounded properties of I alpha omega, on the vex basis, from LP to LQ, say, then it's enough to prove a mixed norm inequalities of the type 1 for this operator T sub alpha. Okay? So remember, type 1 is first integral with respect to U, and then integral with respect to the space variable X. The counterpart of these operators in, uh, for the case uh, for Kaya dimension for larger k is very simple to realize of. Uh, instead of integrating over lines, you want to integrate over subspaces of dimension k. And instead of having power alpha minus 1, you want to have a power alpha minus k. Okay? In that way, when alpha is k, you have the k plate transform. And so we prove, again, sharp results for this operator to satisfy inequality of type 1. So those are the necessary and sufficient conditions. Again, the second one comes from scaling. The third one comes from checking with the characteristic function of the unit ball. And this is the theorem in pictures. 1 over p, 1 over r have to be in those green regions. And q is determined once you have p through the scaling condition. Um, I'd like to mention, again, this is restricted to radial functions. All that, that I'm saying here is restricted to radial functions. Uh, the, for, non, for the general case, not necessarily the radial functions, Duan de Cochia and Cochia <coughs> prove almost sharp results for the case where k is 1 and k is n minus 1. And in the particular cases when you are in the X-ray transform and the, and the radial transform, those are sharp, as I mentioned before. So I'd like to mention uh, um, the, the, the things that were important in the proof of this theorem. Uh, the first one is something related to bounded properties of a maximal operator associated to K-planes, and I'll explain a little bit more of that in the next slides. Uh, the second uh, estimate Kiesin was the lemma that I already mentioned and we used in the previous theorem. And the third one is an inequality, is a version of Kerber's inequality for potentials associated to take place that uh, where this maximal operator shows up. Okay? And uh, so it relates uh, potentials of, with different values of alpha and sometimes when you need to have alpha equals to zero, the, the natural operator that you need to pull is this maximal operator here because you don't have T alpha for alpha equals to zero. So let's talk a little bit about this maximal operator. And um, you know, the, the harder little maximal operator, the standard one is uh, constructed in the following way. You take a function f in Rm and a point x, and then you take the averages, the supremum of the averages over all cubes containing x of the modulus of the function f. Okay? And so we are doing the same here, except that now first we are restricting our function to the k planes. Okay? Uh, if you take the case where k is 1, that gives you the directional maximal operator that I mentioned before, okay? and that shows up in one of these uh, integral or singular integrals at the beginning of the talk. And what we are going to do now is to, to consider that operator mf, but we are going to take the supremum with respect to pi as pi varies in the Grassmannian manifold g and k. And that's going to be called the operator mk. Okay. When k is 1, this is the so-called universal maximal operator, and it can be proved that it's <coughs> modwise equivalent to taking the supremus 
the supremum of averages over parallel five of the absolute value of the function that contains the point x. And so the result that we used in the proof of theorem two was a result that has to do with boundedness properties of mk on Lebesgue spaces when restricted to radial functions. And more precisely, this is what we proved. Um, mk satisfies the following boundedness properties. It's bounded in LP on radial functions when p is uh, greater than n over k, and it is of restricted type <coughs> mk and k. That, that means something. Doesn't matter. Okay, and but the restricted type is the, 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 the actual result that we needed in the proof of theorem two. Okay, the other one comes for free as interpolation with that case and the trivial case L infinity L infinity. Uh, a few remarks about the theorem. When case one, this theorem was proved by Carveri, Hernandez, and Soria, and our methods are different and extend better to higher dimensional cases. Uh, Carveri, Hernandez, and Soria were trying to uh, work with the bounds for the Kakeya maximal operator, and they did that for uh, when restricted to regular functions. I mentioned that a little bit of that at the end of the talk. And something important is that this operator NK is not bounded in LP for general functions. You can use a Visikovic type set to see that. Okay. Um, let me mention how what, what was the key thing in the proof of theorem three, and it's a very nice pointwise inequality. Uh, for a characteristic functions of radial sets. So you have a radial set E, and what we were, we were able to prove is that the, K, uh, the maximal operator associated to K planes, M, when evaluated on a characteristic function of a radial set, is pointwise bounded by the hardly little maximal operator acting on that characteristic function to the power K over M. So MHL stands for the hardly little maximal operator. And those constants depend only on N and K. Okay? And you know that the hardly little maximal operator is a very good operator in the sense that it is bounded LP for P greater than one, it is restricted with type one one, it's very, very nice. So all those properties that this operator has can be translated modulo a power of K over N to the operator NK. Okay. And that's how, so, so the, the theorem on the boundedness properties of uh, the operator uh, NK on radial functions is a, a direct consequence of this inequality. Oh. Well, there are, here are some other consequences of the pointwise inequalities. Uh, from that, you can prove mixed norm estimate for the uh, maximal operator associated to game plays, and something very important that I did not write there is that, of course, that is for radial functions only. Okay, for non radial functions, it's hard to prove it. Okay, and then <coughs> you can obtain weighted versions of theorem 3 for NK. So NK is bounded on LP spaces with uh, weights in the back and half uh, class. So I want to finish now with a, a generalization of these pointwise inequalities for the case when k is 1. Remember that when k is 1, the operator that you have is the directional maximal operator, and m1 is the universal maximal operator. And we were able to extend that pointwise inequality for a function that are LQ radial. So when I talk about radial functions before, radial always meant, meant a function that is constant on spheres centered at the origin, but those spheres are uh, constructed using the Euclidean method. Well, now instead of using two, use q, okay? Square q, q root of uh, the modulus of the components to, this, to, the, to, to the power q. And so in the case when k is equal to one, we were able to prove the same pointwise inequality for characteristic functions of sets that are LQ radial. Uh, and of course, from that, as we did before, we get estimates for the corresponding uh, operator M1, the universal maximal operator. So it turns out, in a, a, 
by that clear and file directly that is bound in the LP for P greater than N. It is, of uh, it is unbounded for P less than or equal to N. We can prove that with a counter example. And when P equals N, it is of restricted with time. Okay, so, so that is the same, the same result that, that before, as before, but extending to AQ radial functions. And so I want to show you a little bit the connection between this operator and one, the bounded edge property that we have on radial fun NQ radial functions and the Cacadia maximal operator. So the Cacadia maximal operator is an operator that is constructed by taking the supremum of averages over a parallel device with a fixed eccentricity, which I'm calling big N there. Okay? And it's very easy to see that it is bounded in LP for P greater than one, and restricted with type 1, 1 because it's pointwise bounded by a, a multiple of the hardy little maximal operator. The big problem here is to determine the bounds for the <coughs> norms of the Cacadia maximal operator as a bounded operator on these LP spaces. And the conjecture is that it has a logarithmic growth, and this conjecture has been proved for a equals to 1, uh, to 2, sorry, and for higher dimensions there are partial, partial results. Now, note the following. It's not difficult to realize that, or, or to see that, the Cacadia maximal operator acting on a function f is pointwise bounded by little n, which is the dimension here, times this operator m1, for which we have this uh, LP boundedness with constant that are independent of big N, okay? So this pointwise inequality together with our results for M1 give us the conjecture when restricted to IQ radial functions. So more precisely, uh, when restricted to IQ radial functions, uh, we have a boundedness of Kn in LP for P greater than N with a constant that is independent of the eccentricity began. The same for the restricted weak type. And then for the strong type, a little n, little n, and the weak and the weak type, little n, little n. We have the logarithmic growth. The first two come right away as a consequence of our theorem. Uh, the, the 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 other two we have to do some interpolation to get the the power of the logarithm that we want there. Okay. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions for the speaker? I have not looked at that. I don't know. Because in fact, um, if you have the boundaries from the zero, then you can also say that the function f is in the space by having the uh -huh. I, I, I 